Hello, this is Stuart Wilde. Chapter 1. Reincarnation, Guides, and the Higher Self. At your birth, the spirit that is the real you entered the earth plane for a short period of special training. It chose the experience as a part of a wider spiritual goal, for it knew that there was no way that it could reach that goal without first passing through the physical. Before you began your life, you knew what that spiritual goal was, and you had the ability to review, in a dimension beyond the earth plane, the general circumstances of your upcoming existence, the body your spiritual energy would inhabit, the parentage that would help you to develop, the geographic area you would find yourself in, your interpersonal relationships, your karmic ties, and the evolution of the earth at the time that you are about to enter it. You reviewed all of this and made its choice deliberately. Let us discuss the real you, that spirit entity that existed before your current existence on the earth plane. Since there are no words in our language to describe that energy, we will call it your higher self. Although this term can be misleading, because your real spiritual identity is not higher than you, it is you. Let us accept it for simplicity's sake, so that we can move on. Your higher self is a collective body of energy. It is vast and ageless. It is everything that you've ever been, stretching back to the edge of infinity. Within it is all the knowledge that you will ever need, and through it you can experience a limitless understanding of yourself and the physical plane. Your higher self is sustained by an intrinsic energy that is even bigger than itself. That sustaining energy we call the force, or the living spirit. The force, like your higher self, is an energy that experiences evolution. It is massive, exhilarating, magnanimous beyond description. Perhaps you may want to call it God. It is not stagnant as some would have you believe. It is growing, dynamic, and has an inner drive or desire to become more of itself. To achieve this, it divides itself into more and more separate parts or definitions. And it does so because it knows that by dividing and spreading out, it will have more power, and having more power, it will grow. The force is a part of each and everything in the physical plane. This includes our planet, the stars and galaxies, and the physical universe as it stretches out in space beyond our perceptions. By its very nature, the force is immortal and never-ending, and because it is the inner light or livingness within all things, we call it universal. The more life force a thing expresses, the more complicated or greater is the extent of the force within it. Therefore, a small bird expresses more of the force than does a rock, and a human being expresses still more than a bird. But everything has the force within it, and that is the key to an individual's understanding. The spiritual energy of your higher self also has the force within it, and it too wants to grow. It began its existence by individualizing from the force, and it realized that, like the force, it could expand by dividing itself into more and more experiences. Among the things it has been are your past lives, but even before it entered your human body, it had various experiences that would help it adjust to the vibrational force of the physical plane. Up to this point, it may have had 20,000 experiences, maybe more. It would have had experiences as energy and light as electricity and sound, as lesser forms of existence, which allow it to gradually adjust to the earth plane. For the higher self would not enter the university of the physical experience in complex form. It would have to go through energy experiences, much like a kindergarten. It is interesting to think that there is a spiritual evolution in all things, that in the sound of a pebble tumbling over a cliff, or within a flower, there are countless dimensions of evolution, Higher selves, experiencing training, destined perhaps one day to be human. 600 lifetimes ago, your higher self might have had an experience as a cow and, bit by bit, learned to adapt its energy to the physical plane. As it learned, it became more courageous. Finally, it felt itself ready to enter the human form, and it did so because humanity, being the highest expression of the force on the earth plane, this was a natural progression for it to make. Now, its first lifetime as a human being was not in a position of great responsibility, such as the president of a multinational company. It was in something simple, a tribal life on the land, or a lifetime in which it could almost stand on the sidelines and observe the goings-on.
Interesting enough, mongoloids and the mentally deficient are two examples of higher selves entering the physical plane for the first time. Their lives are often short. They are usually surrounded by help and love, and little is expected of them. After completing this first lifetime, the spiritual part of you that divided from the higher self to enter into your body drifts back to its source, reviewing its experiences as it goes. This period or dimension between the physical plane and your energy's re-envelopment into the higher self is sometimes called the spirit world. It too is a part of the forces experience and it too is growing and expanding, as are the spiritual energies that find themselves in that dimension. The spirit world consists of thought forms and energy from the force that vitalizes it. The thought patterns that you project into the spirit world are what you will experience. If you die as a Muslim, you will see mosques and minarets, and the spirits evolving around you will be Muslims. You will have a feeling that the spirit world consists only of Muslims. By being dogmatic about your beliefs, you see only what you believe in, and so the spirit world has a nice way of making everybody right. The nature of that world is such that your thoughts and feelings are instantly magnified around you. Therefore, if you enter the spirit world in turmoil, you experience a heightened form of that thought pattern, and an observer would say, subjectively, that you are in hell. Conversely, if your life is in balance at the time you separate from the physical body, you enter a spirit world of peace, harmony, and great beauty, and an observer would say, subjectively, that you are in heaven. It is the nature of the vibrancy of the spirit world that has led to stories of heaven and hell being incorporated into the belief patterns of many religions. When you enter the spirit world, your external experiences are in fact manifestations of the inner you. It is this externalization that has become known in the holy books as the last judgment. It is not a judgment in the sense that there is really any right or wrong. It is a judgment whereby you experience yourself and in so doing you automatically drift to that area in the spirit world that is parasympathetic with your energy pattern. Because you are aware not only of your thoughts and feelings, but of the thoughts and feelings of others, they in turn perceive what it is that you really are. Each feeling that is a part of your inner self makes itself instantly manifest to you, and it becomes uncomfortable and totally disjointed for you to attempt to inhabit a part of the spirit world that is not similar to your energy. On the earth plane, thoughts and feelings come back to you more slowly, and what makes the physical plane such a fascinating training ground is the fact that you practice controlling energy and its reactions without having to experience the consequences immediately. This allows you time to adjust before you go into higher planes of existence where energy patterns materialize faster and are thus harder to master. This time lapse in the physical plane creates the illusion that the events in your life are controlled by some external force, be it God or luck or whatever, rather than by your own thought forms. Because the energy moves so slowly, it seems as if it is not you who are creating your reality. You might indulge in a series of negative thoughts that will take two years to become manifest in your life, and you will say, God did it to me. But once you raise your energy, you come into a spiritual alignment with a higher evolutionary pattern and find thoughts and feelings manifest almost instantly in front of you. It is as if, while still here on earth, you enjoy the exhilaration of another dimension and understand it is you who create the events you experience and your daily life is a reflection of what you actually are on an inner level. This reflection continues in the spirit world. Consequently, evolution is not a matter of life before death and something different after death. It is eternal. The greater your expression of the force on earth, the greater your experience in the afterlife. When you enter the spirit world, your energy will accentuate and you will experience an expansion of your inner self. If the opposite is the case, your energy will have a tendency to become less or lower. That is why hell is described as going down, which of course it is, if that is what you believe. In effect, hell is just one dimension alongside others, moving or oscillating with less vibrancy than those dimensions that express more of the force. It is important, therefore, not to be too concerned about life after death, but to create a strong expression of the force before death. What you are right now is what you would experience in the spirit world if you were to enter it today. Many people drift through life as if they had all the time in the world, 
and in a way they do. But the higher self went to great trouble to get them here, and at the slightest imbalance they may separate again. Life should be looked upon as an opportunity for growth, an incredible adventure, and no one should ever let a day pass without trying to expand his or her perceptions and personal expression of the force. After a period of review, your higher self became restless to continue its evolution, and in a desire to continue its journey triggered the search for another life experience, and so it began to review its resources. It knew what kind of life it needed, if it was to continue its energy experience, and along with other higher selves, it waited and watched for a lifetime that suited its evolution and development. Whenever two humans enter into a sexual relationship, the energy they create is read within the dimension of the higher self. That energy has a unique characteristic, much like a thumbprint, and when the higher self perceives a characteristic that fits its evolution, it moves forward, claiming that energy for itself. There is always one higher self that fits the pattern better than another, even though at times there may be more than one higher self that could accept a particular body. Sometimes when identical twins are conceived, it becomes possible for two higher selves to enter into the earth plane at the same time for similar experiences. But usually twins who are physically identical have very different personalities because they have different higher selves and their evolutions are diverse. When your higher self chooses a possible body, upon conception by the parents, it reviews in detail all the circumstances of the upcoming birth. It can see what physical weakness its future body may have and accepts it as a part of its karmic evolution. For within the higher self, disease is not a negative experience. It is a growth pattern to be relished for the greater understanding it provides. Your higher self does not choose an incarnation on the earth plane on the basis of comfort or material status. It chooses an energy pattern that will help it to fill in the picture. Spiritual evolution is not a progression up a ladder. It is like fitting pieces into a jigsaw puzzle. In one experience you may choose the life of a recluse, and in the next, needing a more outward expression, you may choose a family of roving bandits. Even though a life like that may be a negative experience, it might allow your higher self a brief whirl of outward expression needed after a lifetime as a hermit. To complete your evolution through it, you have to experience the earth plane in its totality. War, famine and disease are all part of the karmic experience. Now you may ask, why would the higher self choose to enter a dimension of pain and suffering? The answer is that it is much like swimming a river. You cannot get to the other side without getting wet. Your higher self cannot come into an understanding of balance in the physical plane without suffering some of the bumps and bruises or rawness of life on earth. The physical is an immediate experience that creates an instant growth pattern within the higher self. It exposes you to great amounts of negativity. It is the university of hard knocks. Realizations present themselves with rude abruptness, and this allows the higher self to grow fast. Such is not generally the case in the spirit world. There, time does not exist, and each evolutionary realization drifts gradually from within. Some might say that the earth is harsh, but in its eternal sense it is not, because negative experiences turn into positive learning when you view them in terms of your total evolution. This is why it is impossible to say what others are going through is either good or bad. It is neither. Their lives are a part of a pattern that they chose before they came here, or are patterns that they have created while here, either through balance or a lack of it. Evolution is totally just. You experience whatever the inner you projects. Therefore, there are no accidents of birth or quirks of fate or misfortune. All that you see around you is a lucid dream that you're experiencing for a short while in order to enhance your understanding. What makes it so exciting is that you can learn to change that dream to your own benefit so that you experience only your highest growth and evolution. But no matter what your circumstances are, all was foreseen by the higher self because within its cosmic overview it could perceive not only the body into which it would incarnate but the general circumstances of its life on earth for the first 13 years anyway. It could see what type of relationship your parents were having and chose that balance or imbalance to work through its karmic patterns. It also knew where it would be geographically and this along with your family's economic circumstances make up a part of the evolution of your higher self. 
All the various patterns in your life, your homeland and its traditions, and your family alignment were a part of your greater understanding. And no matter how difficult some of it may have been, it was all an element of the unfoldment of your higher self, as it strove to express even more of the force. It knew what it was getting into and accepted it. Your life's spiritual goal consists of experiencing and stepping above whatever circumstances you find yourself in. Anything that you find difficult or arduous is almost always your main karmic challenge. It is the aspect that you have to go beyond in order to complete your physical experience. And in doing so, you have to begin wherever you find yourself, with whatever resources you have. It is pointless to wish that your body were stronger and that your circumstances more fortunate because if you needed something different, your higher self would have chosen it. It is by dealing with what you are, what you find in front of you, and by being responsible for your actions that you go beyond the need to experience the challenge of negativity. Once you totally accept the fact that you, not fate, control your life, a door opens silently within you, and without you realizing it at first, you begin a higher evolution. If negativity were not a part of the curriculum, there would be no reason for the higher self to incarnate, because there would be no learning process. For centuries, philosophers have struggled with the idea of a god that is supposedly good, yet seems to allow the suffering of mankind. This dichotomy has never been answered satisfactorily. Usually, you'll be offered some lame response about God's plan, which is the philosopher's way of saying, I don't know the answer. In fact, pain and suffering are not a part of God's plan. They are factors of the coarseness of the vibrational field of the physical plane. The force is not involved. It does not have an immediate awareness of the negativity. If it did, it would have to be it, and the force cannot be a negative energy. Picture it like this. You are watching a film about the suffering of the starving millions and can perceive what they're going through. However, it is not a part of your destiny in this life to experience dying in the gutter. You are cognizant of the circumstances of the starving people because you're watching the film, but the whole event is outside the scope of your involvement. There is nothing you can do about it without infringing on the people's right to experience whatever evolution they have chosen. It is the same for the force. It can see and feel what is going on, but it is not a part of the pattern. It is an energy of indescribable power experiencing evolution outside the vibrational wave band of the negative experience. In the same way, when you watch the film, you are experiencing life beyond starvation. It is by projecting your energy and experiencing its results that you come into an understanding of life and its energy patterns. In the course of a number of lifetimes, you balance what you are to the point where you finally understand the true nature of quest, and your position as a custodian of the force becomes obvious. When that occurs, you have no further need to remain on the earth plane, and you proceed naturally to other evolutions in other dimensions of existence. If you think about it, the physical plane has a built-in governor, if a life experience is extremely harsh, the body deteriorates, the experience is over quickly, and the inner spiritual energy withdraws and returns to the higher self. This allows the physical plane to maintain a correct evolution and balance. Modern technology often holds an evolving spirit in a deteriorating body for years, even though inwardly the spirit is crying to get out, crying to return to its true self. This is also a part of the learning process. There is no shortcut to completing your earth experience. You will have to experience all of it, for metaphysically you can only go beyond something by going through it. Your life builds upon a pattern and eventually that pattern sets you free. You may have experienced lifetimes of great poverty, or your higher self may have chosen to experience a body with physical restrictions, or perhaps you find yourself encased within the confines of social structures or strict religious surroundings where deviation from the norm is impossible. All this is used by your higher self to experience growth and evolution. It chooses the restriction in order to experience a fast concentration of energy. Imagine it as a cloud large enough to cover an entire field. Suddenly the cloud decided to enter a tin can in the far left corner of the field. In order to do so, it would have to concentrate its energy, which would cause its energy to move faster. This would enable it to express more of the force, and so it would grow. The same applies to you. The more you concentrate your energy, the faster it oscillates, and the more of the force you express. As this happens, worlds and dimensions that are oscillating slightly faster than you are open to your perceptions. This opening is the key to life, and the reason for understanding the force within you is so that you can, through your own efforts, graduate from the circumstances in which you find yourself. Anything that you can do to help yourself helps your higher self to move towards its goal.
And as it approaches that goal, you will feel the excitement of worlds that you did not know existed. During your first six energy experiences or lifetimes, you have assigned to you two spiritual beings or karmic angels. These spiritual entities are evolving and they experience growth through the service they perform. The guardian angels are assigned to you to ensure that you complete the experience that you entered into and do not drift far from your target, which you may have a tendency to do. Remember, the higher self expressing as you is not accustomed to the restriction that you are now experiencing, and its choice of life on earth might be very challenging. Let us say, for example, your fourth incarnation was as a woman, in a period when the role of women was very restricted. Your father married you off to a local tyrant, and you could not express yourself beyond the mundane chores of housekeeping and childbearing, and you brought forth eleven children. You might want to commit suicide in order to escape the restrictions. The angels would express energy towards you, giving you a little inspiration beyond the difficulty of your situation. And that inspiration would hold you in the pattern long enough for you to complete the experience. This does not mean that the karmic angels control your destiny. Far from it. They project energy, but what you do with it is up to you. Their role is to allow you to complete the totality of an experience. At the end of these exploratory lifetimes, on average six, you will automatically gravitate to a lifetime that allows you greater freedom. As a man, you may choose the life of an explorer, or as a woman, you may choose to be the only daughter of a rich landowner, from whom you would inherit a position of great responsibility. Ownership of the land would allow you economic stability, and you would express yourself in the variety of possibilities that the position of landowner would afford. After your first six lifetimes, you will be basically in the closing stages of the evolutionary experience of the earth plane, and the incarnations will come more quickly. At this point, you will be joined by an even more powerful energy. This evolving energy, which we call your guide, having completed its lifetimes in the earth experience, has a perception and understanding to help you fulfill your life's goal. Again, do not be put off by terms. What we refer to as the guide can be looked upon as an inspirational energy, a kind of spiritual intuition that has your evolution at heart. If you allow your intellect to react too much, you can get bogged down in definitions and never really get a grip of the concept. Think of it like this. If you were in a dark cave and someone turned on a light, you would not care what the light was called as long as you could see what you were doing. As mortals, we tend to want things defined in little boxes, and yet how do we define the undefinable? The energy or guide that helps you with your life's goal is different for each of your lifetimes. Often it'll be somebody with whom you've been closely associated in a past life. Your mother, a brother, a close friend or lover, an energy now beyond the earth plane that accepts the position of guide in service to you and the force. It does so as an expansion of its understanding. How well your guide performs is inexorably linked to how well you do. The more energy you are able to accept, the more it will push forward. And the more it pushes forward, the more you will evolve. But the guide has to wait for you. It is important to realize that the guide does not have all the answers just because it is beyond the earth plane. It has to work with energy like the rest of us. Nothing is predestined. Furthermore, if everything is not brought together correctly, the guide may find itself repeating the guiding process with other individuals until such time as it understands the correct projection of energy, balance, and imbalance. And so as you grow, the guide grows with you, gradually pulling more and more energy around you, the key being the level at which you are able to accept its power. Deep within you lies a special creativity. It might be in the fine arts, or an ability with animals, or the capacity to be a great teacher, peacemaker, or diplomat, or anything else. These talents become encrusted with your limitations and never surface, trapped by fear, laziness, or spiritual ineptitude. If, however, you enliven yourself and you begin to express your creativity, the guide will have something to work with and will pull in other guides and energies that have expertise in your field of interest. Suddenly you have two, three, or maybe more guides helping you. And as this awakening of consciousness takes place, you might suddenly decide it is time to do something about the condition of your body. As you begin to work on that, your guide pulls in a healing energy that shows you what you need for optimum power, and you grow still stronger. The more you move towards the light, the more is added. And as the process gathers speed, you will notice growth in your life in a matter of weeks.
Understanding the Force is understanding your higher self. Your guide is there, but more than anything else, the growth process is a clearing away of the debris of old thought patterns, bad habits, sloppy performances, and gummy thinking. If everything that you are is clogged by negativism, judgment, and body imbalance, you cannot be a channel for energy. The universe is ready and waiting to enhance your development, for as you develop, so does the totality of the force develop. By expanding your consciousness, you will help everyone else to expand, because first, we all have the force within us, and second, when people perceive the growth in you, they will begin to look at themselves, and each will raise the energy of the other. Nothing in the universe is controlled or guaranteed. Your guide does not control your destiny or decide what you're going to have for breakfast. It projects energy, allowing an opening, a new perspective. You may be walking down a road you have traveled a dozen times, and suddenly you will see a group of trees that you never knew was there. That is the guide teaching you through the higher self. It is fascinating to think that everything in the universe is around you right now. Every dimension, every invisible spirit, every higher inspiration. It is a matter of controlling the physical, emotional, and mental cacophony that dominates daily life, and then suddenly, click, a gate swings gently on its hinges, and before you lies another world. A world that has been there since the beginning. A world of initiates. A world open to all, but attained by few. The force within you is the key. By recognizing it and understanding the interaction between you and your higher self, you begin to control your destiny. For you cannot go beyond the earth plane until you accept that you, not fate, create the events of your life. That your experiences, pleasant or unpleasant, are but outer manifestations of the inner you. Once you accept those facts unequivocally, you rise beyond mass thinking, discarding the constraints of accepted limitations in a way that you might throw out an old shoe. But to go beyond the world is hard. You will constantly face your inner self, its uncertainties, its illusions, its challenges. Bit by bit, you peel away the various layers, eventually reaching a complete communication with your higher self, and all the power and knowledge that is stored there is available to you. You will find yourself able to use information you never knew was there. As this energy flows, its exhilaration will carry you from stepping stone to stepping stone, and you will find life magically unfolding in front of you. You will turn and look back and wonder what took you so long. Chapter 2. Understanding the Force The Force is universal, which means that it is not only in everything, it is also endless. It stretches out not only to an eternity behind you, but infinitely into the future. The Force is also all-knowing, because, being in all things, it knows from its own experience. Your life's goal is to expand the Force within you so that you can perceive beyond what you are now. First, you have to recognize that the force is within you. Next, you have to acknowledge yourself as God, as a part of the living spirit within. No matter what you are physically, what imbalances you may suffer, what situations you have created, you are still a part of the force. If you recognize that and accept your intrinsic goodness or holiness, then the force within you will magnify because you are concentrating on it and you accept being a part of it. You might like to start the day with a personal affirmation, saying, I am the force within. What I am is eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite. What I am has beauty and strength. This is my day, and all that I pull to me is for my highest evolution and growth. Do this early in the morning, and the power of the force increases. It acts as your protector as you step into the day. By recognizing the force and not compromising your position, you enter a special energy that allows light to flow from within you out to the people you deal with. This energy begins to be felt by others, and like a hippopotamus rising languorously from its hippopotamus dreams, an immense power stirs, and all sit up and take notice. When you have enough of the force within you, you are ready to move out from your inner being. You can accept new associations and positions with confidence. And as you take total responsibility for yourself, people will feel the energy and they will ask you to take responsibility for their projects and so on. You can never be unemployed because most people shun responsibility as if it were an exotic disease. Once you've recognized that the force is within you and that you, not fate, God or anyone else, control your life, you are ready for the next step 
which is basically familiarizing yourself with your higher self and its flow of energy in your life. Much like presenting yourself at some royal court, you have to learn the formalities and characteristics of the energy pattern, what it responds to, and best expresses in your life. This part of your training can be exhilarating, for daily life becomes a symbol of your progress, and you pass nothing without seeing its inner message. This dialogue manifests in a symbolic unfolding, and the tramp on the corner that spoke to you on the way to the station is no longer a tramp, but a symbol, a single word in a cosmic paragraph teaching you about yourself. When you learn to view the world as your teacher, you find that your higher self leads you gently back into yourself. It is said that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, but you have to begin to move towards what it is you want, making use of what you have right now. Otherwise, ineptitude rivets your expectations to the floor. Everything around you is there to help you go to the next step, but there's no automatic graduation. You cannot mumble mystery words, cavort over a mystic symbol at midnight and say, I am the initiate, and expect the force to respond. It will not. But by moving toward it and accepting responsibility for your life, you complete the next step. To understand the projections of the force, you have to understand the subconscious mind, which is like a large map on which you are recording the past events of your life. Your waking reality is but a torchlight shining onto one small section of the map. You can see just the events around you. The rest of the map is still there, but to you it lies in darkness, and so it is beyond your conscious perception. In a hypnotic trance, you could review everything that you've ever done, every word you have ever spoken, every experience you have been through. It is all there. You could recall how many footsteps it took to get to work today, or you could recall your first coherent words. Nothing is lost, for within the mind are stored billions upon billions of units of information, and these pieces of information or characteristics make up the inner you. This system of recording begins at birth. The mind programs and stores all your thoughts and feelings and it accepts whatever emotions, fears and limitations it is taught. If a mother says to her child, put on your coat or you'll catch your death of cold, the subconscious mind of the child accepts that as an authoritarian belief pattern. And the next time the child goes out without a coat, his or her mind brings forward that energy and says, lack of coat, sickness, and he or she develops a cold. This type of negative programming builds up, and for the first 13 years of life, children accept totally whatever their parents or guardians tell them. They accept their elders' belief patterns, attitudes, values, and thought patterns. After their 13th year, they spiritually come of age and begin to experience and develop the energy that has been created. What unfolds in their teen years is often very uncomfortable, as they try to bring their belief patterns into a coherent identity of self. The process of dealing with the mind, its negativity, its emotions, feelings and attitudes is the key to spiritual growth. Each thought and feeling that you have about yourself is expressed on an inner level as energy. And that energy, interacting with the universal law, creates the events and circumstances of your life. You can watch this energy by watching what is around you. Do you have nothing but beauty and richness of life? Or are there areas that you would like to improve? By looking at your inner self, you grow, and in doing so, you expand the level of the force you express. As was said, the force is a totally positive energy. It cannot be a part of negativity, for its evolution is beyond that. If you stand in an alley with a big stick in your hand, and you brain and rob the first unfortunate who happens along, the force is not a part of that act. The force is in the stick, in the blood, in the wallet you stole, but it is not responsible for the event, nor does it experience the event as negative. It has no emotion. It is just a divine energy, an observer, not a participant. It evolves in a dimension of perception beyond the physical and is yet a part of it. The more you train your mind and feelings to emphasize the positive, the more you become like the force, a divine observer not connected emotionally with the frailties of human life. However, more is involved than just taking a positive attitude of life. You have to begin to look at whatever limitations lie in the inner you, for the force is unlimited, and the less restricted you become, the more of the force you will express. Every time you turn and face yourself and look at your reactions and feelings, you basically clear away another small particle of debris that has accumulated. In the legend of the Holy Grail, 
This facing of one's inner uncertainties is symbolized by the slaying of the dragon. In overcoming limitation, you move closer to the next dimension, a dimension of unparalleled exhilaration, existing beyond day-to-day -day perceptions. In actuality, you begin to leave the earth plane, for even though your body might still be here, your inner energy is moving away from the physical. This creates an island of strength and beauty all around you, and from that island you, as the quiet observer, look back at the world. You become the same as the force in the stick the robber used in the alley, not reacting to the emotions of others, living your own creation, a world apart. Ah, but what of helping others, you may ask? If you go deep within yourself and clear out the negativity there, you begin to raise your energy. As you do so, you will help others, not because you've assisted them materially, but because you've raised your consciousness. This might sound obscure, but it is a cosmic fact that first you have to heal yourself. You have to find the grail before you will ever be much use to others. You can send them a bag of rice, if you wish, and that will not increase by one iota their expression of the force. To really help people, you have to show them how to increase their power. And if you have not completed your own journey, what will you show them? Confusion? Once you've raised your energy, people will be pulled to you automatically. You will not have to go out and say, come here, I will heal you. People will come to you because those who are growing spiritually seek examples of the force, which are moving faster than they are. For such examples enhance their own expression of beauty by causing their energy to move faster. As you develop, your perceptions become more acute. You experience extrasensory powers or clairvoyance or clairaudience or more likely clairsentiousness, a heightened sense of feeling. And you find yourself in places and situations where you just know what is going to happen next. This power of perception is very strong. It may be tempting to impress others with your newfound prowess. And before you know it, you will have set up your Madame Zora gypsy booth and are advising others. This is fine as long as you realize that psychic power can be a trap. Real metaphysical perception lies in the power of silence. The more you interact with the ordinary world, the more that world holds you in the physical. Beyond the psychic is another dimension, but many people, hooked by the glamour or kudos of having a power a little beyond ordinary, never reach it. If you stay in the world of psychic perception too long, you miss the boat metaphysically, and you will not reach that dimension of the force from which a demonstration of psychic ability is seen as nothing more important than a small child banging two bricks in a playpen. By developing silently, you hold a power to yourself, and the more you do so, the more doors open ahead of you. But you have to travel through the silence, perhaps for many years, and you have to trust that there will be more up ahead. Many modern psychics accept a few fleeting impressions as the totality of their ability, and by constantly presenting their energy to others, burn themselves out on an inner level. They have no momentum to carry themselves across other planes, and eventually this misuse is apt to become manifest as disease. Next time you visit a psychic or medium who has been involved for many years, look at his or her body before you decide if the life of a psychic reader is worth it. A high percentage of them are totally worn out. I mention this because people get trapped in the stupidities of the ego. As you move towards a force, you will find that the ego begins to die, and the subconscious moves over to allow the real you to control your life. Of course, the ego does not give up without a fight. When you consider that you've been putting energy into the subconscious for years, you will realize that it is going to take an effort and discipline to stop doing so. There will be setbacks and dark nights of the soul when it seems that you face the insurmountable. But that is just the energy of the subconscious mind rebelling, refusing to give up its dominant position. It will use every trick in the book because as you express more and more of the force, your mind will gradually lose its grip and for a time you may even feel that you're dying. This is why the stories of the initiates such as Lazarus involved dying and rising again. When those stories were written, there were no words to describe psychological, metaphysical inner events. Therefore, the writer said that Lazarus died and came back to life through his contact with metaphysical understanding, which in his case was represented by the Nazarene. Similarly, the initiates of the Great Pyramid were placed in a sarcophagus or tomb, and there they would symbolically die. Using herbs and various mind control techniques, 
the high priest would assist the student to experience an inner vision of dimensions beyond the earth plane. In order for this to happen successfully, the student had to enter into a catatonic trance, centering his subconscious mind enough to perceive beyond the physical. The writers of that time, not totally comprehending what was going on, wrote to the limit of their understanding. And so you'll find that the story of the initiate entering the tomb or sarcophagus, dying and rising again after three days, pervades many religions and cults. Some, such as the Egyptian mysteries and the cults of Mithra, were common knowledge before the time of the Nazarene. Jewish writers knew of the mysteries of the Great Pyramid, because the Jewish tribes had spent many years in Egypt, and the cult of Mithra was the religion of the Roman occupiers of the Holy Land. And so you'll find that the stories of the Nazarene follow closely the stories of Mithra. As the negativity of the mind loses predominance over your day-to-day -day affairs, what you think you are dies, and gradually the real you comes to life. As the energy of your higher self begins to establish a stronger pattern, you literally become the initiate, but the process is gradual, a tussle between inner objectives. To win this battle is your prime spiritual objective. By centering and disciplining your subconscious mind, you allow the energy of the force to flow. At first, you will feel that the force is not there, for its power expressed through your higher self is not a power that you will ever be able to touch, taste, hear, or see. You may have fleeting impressions of it being with you, and you will see it working in your life, but you will not be able to experience it directly. It comes round the mind like a wind. You will know that something is happening, but you will not be sure what. As you gradually raise your energy, you will know it is there because of an exhilaration of self, but you will never have concrete proof. You will just notice if it ever leaves or drops. Once established, this constant flow from the higher self becomes addictive. In fact, you will become frightened at not being a part of it, for you will find yourself abandoned in the world with all its uncertainties and fears. By keeping up your energy, however, allowing nothing to impinge upon your expression of life, and knowing and working with the power daily, you actually build around you an invisible energy curtain. This power is moving faster than the energy you meet in daily life, and so negativity projected to you bounces off and you have a shield of total power. This expression of positive power goes out ahead of you. As you walk up to it in your day, all is balance and in flow, and you are immediately aware of any pitfalls, for there are no accidents in life, no innocent victims. Through a balance or a lack of balance, you control every event in your life. The man in the alley who is struck by the stick is involved deeply on an inner level, because his energy, his imbalance, his thought forms, brought him to where he found himself in the alley being robbed. If he had had more of the force within him, he would have turned left, not right, and we would find him half a mile away in a shop eating cake, and the energy pattern of the robbery would be a part of another person's growth and evolution. Ah, but, what if? What if the man in the alley had been delayed? What if? Within the power of the force, there are no what-ifs. It is you, only you, who create every moment of your life. Whatever you experience is of your own making. If you want to make progress spiritually, you will have to accept that fact. You are living in a dangerous world. At any minute, you may be plucked out. You have a responsibility to maintain balance in your thoughts, in your emotions and feelings, in your physical body. If you do not, you will find yourself in an energy pattern that is out of control. It may manifest as something small, like an argument at work, or as something more threatening. Some loony jumps the traffic light in front of you and pins your car to the side of the bus station, and your energy departs for the spirit world. People say, poor Harry, such an unfortunate accident. It must have been the will of God. But it is not the will of God, and you should not give the force a bad name. It is Harry's energy, what he felt about his wife, his lack of power, the argument he had with his wife just before he left, the two whiskeys too many the night before, the lack of respect he felt for his body, the energy he'd built over the years, the way he expressed that energy in his life. All these things led him to that traffic light at that particular moment to experience a growth pattern. When Harry gets back to the higher self, he will understand how his life was his responsibility. He will see it all, not in pain and anguish, but as a learning. For within the higher self, all is alkaline and positive. There is no sin. 
There's nothing that you can do that can be regarded metaphysically as sinful. There is high energy that expresses the force, and there's less high energy, but that is all. Whatever you create, you experience. Its effects will be around you when you die, as they are while you are alive, and your life is a matter of learning to deal with that. A person who violates the rights of others infringes on their freedom and creates an energy of restriction around himself. That in turn pulls to him others who will violate his rights. It is not crime and punishment in the sense of retribution for sin. It is more energy in motion, its consequences if you like. Sin is a creation of the subconscious mind. It is a moral code, is regarded by tribal members as sinful. However, whatever is sinful to you is not sinful to someone else. In Africa, high on the plains of the Serengeti, there is a small tribal village that has been there many years. Every morning, the men of the village rise and walk casually to the end of the village, where they urinate up against a particular tree. God knows what it does for the tree. This is accepted behavior, and the women of the village do not react to it. Now, take a few friends, go to the local bus stop tomorrow around 8 o'clock in the morning, and do the same thing. Then write to me from prison and let me know how your villagers reacted. Sins are creation of the mind, a shifting sea of customs, rules, and traditions. The laws of the force are beyond emotion, because the force is just energy. It does not make judgments about your performance. It is perfect love, natural. It has certain symmetric patterns that seem to unfold according to whatever energy you put in, but these patterns do not stand in judgment against you. They just unfold according to the level of balance you maintain. So it is in physical evolution that you practice understanding the force, learning to work with balance and control, in conditions suited to you, until such time as you are ready to leave for higher ground. When that happens, you are joined by a guiding energy that will help you evolve more quickly. That guiding power is with you right now, as you read this book, ensuring that what you have, you need for your growth. Let us review. To understand the force, you have to acknowledge its existence. Then you have to recognize that, since it is in all things and in you, you have the power to control all things. By controlling your mind, you can perceive all things. Discipline sets you free to project the force to your own ends, and those ends will gradually lead you into an evolution beyond where you are now, and that is important. Chapter 3. Developing a Flow of Communication with the Force Once you understand that the force is in all things, and that you can use it to your benefit, you then need a working knowledge of how it manifests and what levels of energy are available to you. Let us discuss more fully your guide and how its evolution is linked to yours. Often the term spirit guide conjures up visions of a Victorian seance with a white-haired old lady squeakily asking the ceiling, Is anybody there? This image of guide confuses. The guide is not an Egyptian prince or a Red Indian chief or a nun from the Renaissance. It is an energy evolving beyond the reincarnational pattern of the physical plane. And because its energy is slightly beyond your perception, your subconscious mind creates a symbol it understands and brings forward an image of a Red Indian because that feels comfortable to it. That energy has to have a name, and so the mind creates one, and so on. A process of the subconscious mind creating images it understands. If you were walking through a wood and saw a nature spirit, your mind would not understand the energy pattern because the nature spirit's energy would be a flashing, vibrant life force moving faster than the eye can normally perceive, indefinable to the subconscious mind. But your mind, not liking to accept a visual pattern with which it is not familiar, automatically reorganizes the information into a symbol that it understands and you will say, I saw this little leprechaun wearing a green hat and sitting on a rock. It was playing a flute. That is a peculiarity of the mind and its symbols. Your guide is also a spontaneous flash of vibrant life force, using its vibrancy to help you evolve. And because of your guide's position, associated as it is with your higher self, it acts as a key, allowing you a storehouse of perception. This information is vital to your growth, but it will not come forward until you are ready to accept it on an energy level. For your guide is not going to blow you away by overloading the circuit. It has more power than you will ever need. But a part of your guide's learning is to collate all that power, omitting nothing, then ply it out to you in quantities that will not put you into imbalance. I once attended a mind control course in London, England. 
One of the students was a simple lad with an endearing genuineness about him. The course lasted over two consecutive weekends, during which time he had a great spiritual awakening. He learned about the mind, the hidden capacities of man, and the ancient wisdoms, and he became inspired. No doubt his guide was pleased and pushed forward even more energy. A crescendo began to build in the young man. He touched his inner power strongly and quickly, and soon began to feel himself invincible. He felt himself the greatest spiritual being on the earth plane. Now, his subconscious mind had in it a symbol that said, Jesus of Nazareth was the highest spiritual being that ever lived. Therefore, the lad felt that he must be Jesus. Two weekends later, he attended a follow-up workshop lecture. On entering the meeting room, he declared that he was Jesus and that his energy was invincible. The others stood around mumbling, yeah, yeah, and taking little notice, whereupon the young man, feeling a need to demonstrate the great power he felt from within, announced that he could fly. Still, he was ignored. Moments later, much to the consternation of all present, he launched himself from the second story of the building into a fountain in the courtyard below. Interestingly enough, the janitor of the building, having decided that that very day was the time for the fountain's annual cleaning, had emptied it. Our young quester flew through the air from 40 feet and found himself in the arms of solid concrete. His guide resigned. I offer this story to demonstrate that, in dealing with energy, it is possible to become overloaded. The guide has to ensure that you maintain a cohesive balance to your evolution. He has to make power available to you, but the limit is you. The key, therefore, is how much you can open to the force, that benevolent power that has been waiting for you since the beginning of time. Many wish to be great communicators, to channel a higher energy in the new age, and yet they do not understand that energy can only flow in quantities they are ready to accept. A simple rule, but many miss the point. If you want to teach, bring a power, a healing for the new age, begin with yourself by looking at the energy of your life. See what it is that holds you back. Old association, negative ways, poor eating habits, a lack of purpose, a lack of courage, perhaps. Taking stock of your position will probably make you realize you have everything you need and that your life goal lies in front of you. If it did not, you would have left the earth plane some time ago and would be experiencing evolution elsewhere. Communicating with your guide and your higher self is mostly a matter of discipline. You have to go at it as if your life depended on it. Your mind is strong. It has been in command for many years and will not give ground unless it has to. The effort is like swimming against the current, and as you clear away the debris, the light shines even stronger, and its power encourages you to go deeper. But first you must rouse what you think you are. Your mind has created many rigid patterns, habits if you will, and it will hold on to these habits as if its life depended upon them, which in a way it does. Shake the tree, break the routines, allow constant change to create freshness around you, Get up at three o'clock in the morning and have breakfast. Then just as your mind protests, surprise it. Take it to an icy lake and throw it in. By radically altering the patterns around you, you confuse your mind into releasing its grip. And that is your key to a fuller experience of the higher powers. Right now, the power of your mind, your emotions, what you believe about yourself, create an impenetrable barrier through which the force cannot flow. Once you have disciplined your mind and controlled your emotions, the energy of your higher self will flow through, and the more it does, the more light you will have for your path. Trouble will melt away, and you will fully understand what was meant by the golden age. Without discipline, your chances are slim. In truth, they are nil. Chapter 4. The Four Disciplines of the Initiates Mention discipline to your subconscious mind and it will reach for its hat and coat. Why? Because your mind knows that when you establish discipline, it will lose control. And it will not give ground unless it absolutely has to. To win the battle, you have to create as high an energy as possible, then guard it, watching carefully to keep it up at all times. As long as your energy is high, you will control. But let it drop and your subconscious will dominate. The very nature of the physical plane will conspire to pull you down. 
partly because of its baseness and partly because you will become tired or your eating habits will be poor or you will let negative emotion creep into your life. Your evolutionary learning process is dominated by your ability to recognize and control the ebb and flow of energy around you. For like all energy, metaphysical energy is volatile. It never stays still. If it is not going up, it is going down. Even though you will never have a concrete experience of the force, your feelings will tell you when it is with you and when it is not. And soon you will train yourself to recognize the subtleties of energy affecting your life. The four disciplines which were known in the olden days as the four disciplines of the initiates are physical discipline, nutritional discipline, emotional discipline, the discipline of balance. Each one warrants a book unto itself, but a brief discussion of them here will give you the groundwork and you'll be able to handle the rest for yourself. Physical discipline is acquired through a knowledge of your body. When you have a thorough understanding of your physical experience, you will step above it and a gate will open automatically. It is impossible to have a higher experience until you have mastered the one that you're in. This does not mean that you have to heal your every ailment instantly. What the discipline asks is that you take responsibility for your body, learn about it, practice controlling it, exercise it, and respect it, making sure that the physical experience does not become a runaway horse and cart to the point where your body controls you rather than you control it. If there's a disease in your body, do not roll over and quit. Instead, you should affirm, what I am is the force within. I'm not my body. I'm not my emotions. I'm not my mind. I'm eternal, immortal, and infinite. And what I am has beauty and strength. And there's nothing that I cannot learn to control. There are various ways of learning about your body and establishing control. Yoga, exercise, meditation, sitting still, taking walks in silence, fasting and cleansings, and study. Choose whatever path you wish, but choose one, for it is important for you to know what you're doing. Just for fun, place your finger exactly on your pancreas. If you're not sure where your pancreas is, put your finger where you think it is. Then get a book on human anatomy and you'll probably laugh, because a great percentage of those asked have no idea where their pancreas is or what is its function. One lady in a recent seminar placed her finger behind her right ear. Just for the record, the pancreas runs under the stomach and it runs crossways from the duodenum to the spleen. This exercise is important because it illustrates that most people know little about the bodies they are in. Consequently, when something goes wrong, their minds react in fear fueled by ignorance. Each pain becomes a trauma rather than a signal for them to commence the appropriate self-healing. Once you know how your body works, what vitamins and minerals it needs and how its various components function, you are able to establish around you a confident power. This power allows you to feel that you, not doctors or drugs or some outside force, control your body, that you have the power to heal whatever circumstances might develop, and that you can live without fear. Once you have established that fact, you can turn your mind to other things, but it is difficult to affect control if you think that your pancreas is behind your ear. Take time to understand yourself physiologically, your digestion, duodenum, pancreas, colon, gallbladder, liver and kidney. How do the various functions of your body work? How does your blood flow? How is energy carried through your nervous system? What constitutes healthy teeth, hair, gums, eyes and so on? Once you understand the nature of your vehicle, you are in a position to dominate it. Next, establish a firm understanding that you are not your body. You are an energy of your higher self, a part of the God force. You are in this body because you chose it, and what it has become is not the will of God. It is what you have created with your thought patterns and experiences so far. There is nothing that you cannot reverse, but people sometimes find themselves trapped by habit. You can inspire someone to give up salt, and they may cut down to just six bags of salty potato chips per day then wonder why the universe is punishing them when things fall apart. That is the way of the ordinary people. The path demands a special dedication. It demands that you impose absolute control, for as you raise your energy, the path gets narrower. The slightest slip and you may plunge from a great height. There are no gray areas. Either you are in control or you're not, and the force, being totally impartial, cares not one way or the other.
The history of man is full of stories of individuals who felt that God or something was going to save them at the last minute. Where are they? They are in the next dimension, understanding differently. If you want to be more than you are now, you have to take to the task in a full frontal attack. That is the attitude of self-determination known as the path of power or the way of the warrior. A motive terms perhaps, but you need power to break through the constraints of the mind and control of the physical is the first step of your journey. Once you have this control, you automatically enter an exclusive dimension for the outside world knows nothing about balance and so your energy becomes a part of the universe where the power of the force is felt and that will attract others. Most people live bland lives. They are like jellyfish plopped in a puddle. They're not going anywhere and eventually the puddle evaporates and they depart the physical. By controlling your body, you hoist your jellyfish out of the puddle into a pond and from there out into an ocean which in this case is the energy expression of the force. The next discipline, nutritional discipline, is closely linked to the first, for you will have to express whatever you are to become through your body, and that body will have to eat. There is no faster way of raising your energy than adopting good eating habits. Foods such as salt, sugar, and refined products have a tendency to lower your energy, whereas foods such as fruits and vegetables raise it. As you center on controlling the physical, your body's nutritional needs become clear and you gradually become your own healer. But the healing process cannot occur unless you maintain an alkaline balance in the food you eat. If your diet is too acid or if you eat excessive amounts of food, your body never gets a chance to rebuild and heal itself. Consequently, it gradually deteriorates. Proteins, alcohol, nuts, grains and dairy products, except yogurt, along with sugar and salt, are acid foods. Fruits, vegetables, and juices are alkaline. For an optimum balance, you need an 80% alkaline diet. This means concentrating on fruits and raw vegetables using proteins only in small quantities for when you need energy. A person in control of his life needs only about 50 grams of protein a day. This should consist of just 7 ounces of flesh protein or a vegetarian equivalent or 36 ounces of yogurt depending on the brand. The rest of your diet should be alkaline. There are some exceptions. For example, if you are in a very strenuous or physical occupation, you may need more than 50 grams of protein a day. There are many books to help you learn about nutrition, and the more you know, the more you control. Generally speaking, people eat far too much acid, and that creates a hotbed for disease. Unfortunately, there are almost no packaged, bottled, or canned goods that do not contain either sugar or salt. Sugar is used to appeal to your emotions. Salt is used as a preservative and continues to act as such after ingestion. Food so treated tends to linger in your body, not digesting correctly, putrefying and eventually causing disease. You may find it necessary to give up buying that kind of food and to rely mostly on fruits, vegetables, grains and unpackaged goods. Preparing such foods takes a little more effort, but you have to make the choice. Each instance of your life, you make decisions that affect your development, and the combination of those decisions shows up in the circumstances you experience. What you eat creates your body. The more you rely on fresh foods that have the life force in them, the more energy you will have. There is little life force in pizza, sad but true. In conclusion, it's best for you to maintain an alkaline diet, avoid sugar and salt, and, as long as you do not abuse it with alcohol or drugs, your body will heal itself. And as your energy rises, your aches and pains will fall away. It takes time. Often, poor condition results from tens of thousands of unbalanced meals. And this is not reversed in one day. You have to be patient with yourself. Once you're on the path, have learned about your body, and accepted responsibility for it, you're ready for the third discipline, emotional discipline. This follows automatically. As you work on your body and your nutrition and begin to move away from the coarseness of the physical, your mind will react emotionally and mental discipline is the hardest of all. You think that you have your energy under control, then suddenly an upset occurs and it all falls apart. This is because the mind has an attitude. It thinks events and circumstances are real and acts accordingly. When your energy drops, your mind becomes capricious and argumentative, making unreasonable demands. 
What happens on an energy level is that the orange or emotional part of your aura spikes into the red, the physical, and the yellow, the mental. On either side of it, your body reacts physically and your mind reacts with frenzy and you find yourself bickering with the world and yourself. The key to establishing control is to spend a part of each day completely alone. Use the time to review your feelings and concerns. Allow an emotional maturity to develop whereby you deeply understand that nothing is real, that there is no death, that all is evolution. This will detach you from the emotional impetus of events and you will feel a power guiding you beyond day-to-day -day struggles. If others are pulling you off balance, it is your responsibility to walk away, maintaining control at all times. It becomes doubly important to avoid confrontation because your life is like a stick flowing down a river. Interpersonal strife snags it, bringing your progress to a standstill. The old Taoist sages who understood this flow of energy taught their students to avoid confrontation, for it fuels the ego and strengthens the power of the subconscious over your affairs. The sage walks away. Only the fool stands and fights. If someone wants something from you, give it to him or her. That is the universal flow, for in doing so, you are not holding on. Your energy is fluid and it allows you to remain open to receive from other areas. If you are in an imbalanced relationship, fix it. If you cannot do so, leave. If you are hampered by a lack of money, put your trust in the force and move towards your goals anyway. That is flow. Being in balance with yourself allows the force to work with you. All is maintained in your life. There will always be opportunities for growth and people will seek you out. Here is an exercise you may like to try. Rise at dawn and spend about an hour walking out of doors, silently reviewing any concerns you may have. Towards the end of the walk, select a large and powerful tree. Stand with your back to the tree, placing your hands behind your back against it. Take a deep breath and relax your entire body. Begin by acknowledging the spiritual evolution in nature. Take another deep breath and while you exhale say, May the living spirit grant evolution to the spirits of nature. Then take another deep breath and repeat your invocation for the spirits of fire, air and water. In this way you establish communication with your nature self and if you are sensitive you will feel the elements respond. Next, feel the energy of the tree flowing down through its trunk into your body. As you begin this visualization you may feel a slight rocking motion in your own energy. If you are sensitive, you will actually feel the power of the tree metaphysically cleaning your energy, for nature absorbs emotion. After a few moments, the movement will stop and you will not be able to absorb any more. Acknowledge the tree and the power of nature and realize that your power, in turn, helps the tree and nature to evolve. So there is a mutual exchange at a mystical level. Return home in silence. Tension builds only when your mind has no release. By refreshing yourself through silence and nature, you constantly revitalize the inner you. Dawn is your strongest hour. If you can rise in time to meet the day, that effort becomes a discipline that you use to establish control. Take 24 minutes, one for each hour of the day, either meditating or walking in silence, but on your own. Use the time to project yourself into the day. As you center your mind, the power of your higher self goes out and surrounds the events you will meet, acting as a spiritual forerunner, enlivening energy in front of you. Visualize your day flowing. See the people you will be dealing with responding to you positively. See your body strong and healthy. See the day in its creative splendor. See beauty in all things. Release any emotional problems from the previous day and take time to really feel the inner you. Say in your own words, Today is a beautiful day. I control what I am, and what I am has beauty and strength, and what I pull to me is for my highest evolution and good. Finally, incorporate exercise into your daily regimen by including, say, 20 minutes of heart-pumping aerobic movement. This will help you to control your emotions, for exercise produces in the brain special chemicals called endorphins, which naturally relax you.
By setting up your day before the rest of the world has risen, you establish an energy that cannot be overwhelmed by the negativity of others. When you use this technique, you will find that anger, judgment, and interpersonal squabbles fall away as others get an inkling of your unseen power. The more you express this power, the more you will experience an inner knowing that teaches you to evolve beyond the earth plane. Leaving the earth plane and stepping into dimensions beyond the five senses without actually dying is accomplished through the fourth discipline, the discipline of balance. It allows you to live in the world without being a part of it and sets you free to function at a higher level of perception for the dimension in which you are heading is one of complete balance and it will not open if what you are is falling apart. Having created a discipline of physical, nutritional and balanced emotional aspects, you will need fine tuning. Meditating for 24 minutes a day gives you balance. Doing so for eight hours a day makes you imbalanced. Spiritual growth is not a matter of withdrawing from life. It is a matter of developing the power within you and then expressing it in some way. You are here to experience life, not to escape from it. It is useful to remember that energy must be delicately balanced. And as your energy rises and your perceptions grow, you will have to guard that fine line. Everything that surrounds you has energy, being either alkaline, acid, or neutral. Your life, like your food, should be 80% alkaline. Of course, you will need a little acid for balance, but you get more than enough of that just walking down a city street or dealing with day-to-day -day thought forms. Alkalinity surrounds you with a sympathetic energy, allowing the guide to communicate more freely and helping your body to heal itself. Look at your life and ensure that you have balance around you, not just in the way you eat, but in the company you keep, the places you go, the colors and fabrics that surround you, the entertainment you enjoy, and the music you listen to. Each of these has an alkaline acid property, and it's simple to identify it. Ask yourself, is parsley alkaline or acid? Is coffee acid or alkaline? The answers come automatically. What about colors? Is red acid? Certainly as are orange, yellow, and black. You should use those colors to accentuate, but they should not predominate in your home or in the clothes you wear. Red, orange, and yellow hold you into the physical, emotional, and mental energies. And by spiritually aligning with the force, you're trying to go beyond these aspects. Black is the color of evolution, an imploding energy, not negative, but basically an energy that is falling in on itself. The color is attractive to individuals who are involved in negativity and violence because such people project fear and black allows them to feel people's reaction which gives them a feeling of power over others. The difficulty they eventually experience is that the negativity constantly coming back at them builds up until one day it is made manifest in some horrendous event. This is why many of the practitioners of black magic unable to dissipate the energy they create come to a grisly end. The other main users of black are ladies of the evening who need to feel the sexual reaction of their clients. They wear black to allure. Black is neither good nor evil. It just implodes upon itself. Therefore, it should be worn sparingly. Green is neutral and passive, the great relaxer. In the olden days, the area behind a theatrical stage was painted green in order to calm the actors before a performance. Nowadays, that area is sometimes known as the green room, even if it is painted a different color. Green has the soothing effect of nature. Blue, indigo, and violet are alkaline, for they help you to come in touch with your higher self. White is also alkaline and a good color to wear if you deal with a lot of people. It protects you from their energy and reflects any negativity or imbalance that may be directed towards you. Most pastels are alkaline because they're very soft, and even though they may tend towards physical, emotional, and mental colors, they express light and color with an understated beauty. Fabrics are easy to discern. Cotton, wool, silk, and other natural fabrics are alkaline, whereas man-made fabrics such as polyester or rayon are acid. They retain a lot of static electricity and will gradually lower your energy in much the same way as neon lighting does. There is also a balance in music, Rock and roll, acid or alkaline? Debussy's Claire de Lune, alkaline or acid? 
It isn't difficult. Basically, rock, soul, and jazz are acid, whereas classical music is generally alkaline. Opera, on the other hand, varies. At times, it is very acid and emotional, and at others, inspirational and alkaline, depending on the mood of the piece. What do you think country and western music might be? If you answer acid, you're correct. Usually the music is a story. The guy can't get his life together, his horse has died, and his lady has taken her love to town. It is emotion expressed as orange in the music, and so an energy that will hold you into the baser patterns. And that you have to watch. If you work in a place that constantly plays rock music, you will find it hard to stay balanced. The music will continually push out its colors, red and orange, and you will not be able to rest. And after a while, you will be unable to balance your inner strength. Being sensitive to your surroundings helps you create a discipline of balance, and whatever discipline you impose in dedication to your inner quest strengthens you all the while. Of course, such dedication is not compulsory. But if you are serious about going beyond day-to-day -day reality, you will have to be sensitive to the world around you. If you are not sure whether or not a certain thing is helpful and alkaline, use this guideline. If it is physical, emotional, or mental, it is probably acid. If it is neutral, that is to say natural, or philosophical, or spiritual, not religious, it is alkaline and will help you come into touch with the self. By applying this rule of thumb, you establish the power to pull to you all that you will ever need. You will express the force in such magnitude that you become an energy center unto yourself. Then your creative abilities mingle with the universal law, and life takes on a special spontaneity. Money appears when you need it. People support what you're doing, and opportunities will carry you to the next step. Then your creative abilities mingle with the universal law, and life takes on a special spontaneity. Money appears when you need it. People support what you're doing, and opportunities that will carry you to the next step crop up. Chance meetings, unusual happenings. Through balance, you become linked to the power of the universe, and your possibilities expand to infinity. Balance allows you to be unmoved by people, politics, supply and demand. Your energy exists apart from them, and its spirituality gradually changes what you are. Through your intrinsic magnificence, you pull to you automatically all that you need. And the world's problems do not bring you down, for you're beyond them, observing life from the sidelines. And in so doing, you allow others their proper evolution understanding all the while that by being dedicated you give strength inwardly to yourself and to the world around you. It is impossible to quantify your effect on others, but metaphysically your efforts contribute to the evolution of the world, for your energy is used by the higher powers to allow an inspiration to continue. The sage is never aware of how his power affects changes in others, and that is what makes him a sage. Your power comes from understanding that where others are is where they need to be, and whatever they're doing is for their highest growth, and you should not judge it. By totally accepting other people's reality, you express true universal love, and you invigorate your own progress, because judgment does not hold you back to the baser physical level. Negativity, famine, pollution, nuclear bombs, interpersonal strife, are all a part of the curriculum of the physical experience. You will never change that. No one has. By being an observer, you rise beyond the quagmire of karma, and this is what frees you to contribute through balance. It is an inner contribution that is little understood and receives no recognition. But the power is there, and it creates opportunities, not only for yourself, but for others. It is a very special power, your gift, your discipline, your dedication to the force. Militancy is a trap. You cannot go beyond the world if you're angry with it. As your consciousness awakens, you may look around you and say, the world is a dreadful place. I'll have to fix this. Send some rice to the starving millions. This is a natural reaction, but it hides you from an infinite view of things. Do you think that the force, the guides, and all the powers that oversee the earth plane could not change things in a second if they wanted to? Of course they could, but if they did, there would be no experience here, no challenge to step above. It would be like a tightrope walker placing his rope on the ground. Who would pay to see that? 
Suffering is a part of each person's spiritual growth. You have been through it yourself, perhaps not in this lifetime, but in others. It is a valuable lesson, and those experiencing the physical are graduating through it. It is impossible for us to judge accurately another's life, because we're not privy to all of the circumstances that make up that person's inner being. And if we insist on interfering, then someday someone will interfere with our evolution. How often have you begun a project only to have a well-wisher take the tools from your hands and you wind up with a gate painted green when in fact you only wanted to change the hinge? That frustration is what happens in a cosmic sense to the world today as well-wishers rearrange people's circumstances to fit their view of how things should be. If you want to change the world, change yourself. Then others will be pulled to what you are and will change themselves. And all will come to a gradual understanding, for observation is power, judgment is weakness. When you establish a discipline and maintain it for a while, the energy of your guide and of your higher self will really begin to flow. You will feel its presence. It will not be a voice from above, but a communication from within. And it will be important for you to give credence to that communication. The difference between the sage and and the ordinary man, is that when the former receives a communication from within, he acts, while the latter thinks it's not true. Being in flow and a part of the force will allow you to become sensitive to inner promptings. And though they may be just faint feelings, the more you acknowledge the communication, the more the guide will convey. It's important for you to believe what you hear and feel. Intuition is a great power. It is the higher self communicating, showing you which way to go. It is the voice that, as you enter the aircraft, says, sit there, and you find yourself next to the very connection you have been hoping to make for ten years. It is the power out ahead of you that will open doors and clear the path. But you have to do the walking, carry the load, so to speak. It is there guiding you, and everyone has experienced it from time to time. As you open to the guide, you forge a permanent link, a connection that allows you sensory perception of other planes of existence. That perception is not a voice from heaven. It is an inner communication that is moving at a vibrancy much greater than you're used to. That is why you're not generally aware of its presence. Gradually, as you raise your energy, you begin to hear, see, and feel the communication more strongly. It does not happen overnight, and your progress is predicated on how well you establish the four disciplines in your life. Once you have mastered discipline and balance, you can familiarize yourself with the manner of communication. Since your whole life is a symbol, a synchronistic interplay of your inner energy, the communication can come from anywhere. As you raise your energy, the synchronicity or the counterplay moves faster and faster, and you automatically link your consciousness to all that is around you. Twelve ducks flying upside down, north to south, means nothing to the man in the street, but to you they may hold the answer to a monumental question. Some years ago, I found myself in a complicated financial situation. I was faced with either accepting less than I wanted and leaving a specific area, or holding out for more but having to stay and wait as the deal unraveled itself. I was walking on the beach, pondering the question, when I came across a child's playing card laying at my feet. Picking it up, I noticed it had an ordinary geometric pattern on one side, while on the other it had the number eight. To my subconscious mind, the number eight represents the Ogdoad, a symbol of money in Pythagorean numerology. Delighted with my find, I took the card to mean that I should accept the money and leave, which as it turned out, was the right decision. Now, people may say that it was just a coincidence, and for some that would be true. But once in flow, you're inexorably linked to the whole cosmos, and nothing is a coincidence, absolutely nothing. There are signs and lessons everywhere, in the things people say, in the circumstances that unfold through life, in the things you see as you move about. The higher self is subtle, It does not bang you on the head with a plank. It allows gradual growth as you discover a deeper and deeper meaning to the world around you. Dimensions are inward. They unfold to energy like those Chinese dolls that you take apart to find another doll inside, and yet another, and so on. 
Dimensions are infinite inner space, and the only thing that bars you from experiencing it all is incompatibility between your energy and the dimensions you wish to experience. For dimensions permeate physical reality, and though you may not be aware of them, the sage standing next to you might. Your mind is the block. It stands between you and the whole glory of the cosmic experience. However, it performs a vital function. For without the constraints of the mind and its physical housing, the brain, you would be overwhelmed by incoming sensory information. Your brain acts as an inhibitor, holding you in the physical plane long enough to experience it. When you come to the end of the earth plane, your mind will be free of the brain and it will have less power to restrain you. You will discover your higher self and you'll be off and running, so to speak. This power lies waiting for you, and no matter at what stage you find yourself, sage or novice, there's more up ahead. If you're standing still, thinking that you've done enough, you obviously have not. Beware of teachers who say, I have discovered the great cosmic way, follow me. For those who say they have, have not, and you cannot reach the dimension of your higher self by following a creed, an energy pattern created by the subconscious mind of another, no matter who, right or wrong, you have to do it yourself. Your life, your decisions, your experience of events. There is a saying in Taoist philosophy which goes, what is, isn't, and what isn't, is. This neatly summarizes the difference between being just in the physical world and believing what you see is real and being in the illusion of the higher self which is true reality. When you're in your higher self, you will find you can manipulate your own destiny, but you cannot reach that level of metaphysical ability by following someone else. You have to be out on your own, accepting your own promptings, your own inner messages. You have to do this in silence. Often those that you leave behind will react. They will want you to endorse their point of view and to support their system. But once you come into your higher self, you develop a special independence. If you then resort to militancy, saying that what you left behind is no good, society will string you up, and you may find yourself experiencing your higher self from the next dimension anyway. Beyond the earth plane while criticizing it, for it serves us as all restriction does. It holds us long enough for us to experience ourselves, whereby we understand the true nature of freedom. The system also serves those that holds today, for tomorrow they will step above it. To go beyond the earth plane, you have to be able to accept it, to see beauty within it no matter what, to see it as perfect. Then you develop the spiritual maturity to leave things as they are, understanding that the force knows what it's doing, and that pain and suffering and the encasement of the physical are temporary conditions that people actually need for their spiritual growth. Once you can step away and cease to judge others, allowing them to be without infringing on them or trying to save them, the last thing they need is someone to save them, you are ready through discipline to evolve from the physical. This process can be accomplished before you die and you literally perceive beyond the physical while still here. Death is not the only way out, but few people have discovered that for themselves. The ones who have are not around to talk about it. When Lot's wife looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah and turned into a pillar of salt, it signified metaphysically that if you align with the carnal physical, your energy becomes as coarse as that which surrounds you. To the right of the story, a pillar of salt was about as physical as he could get, and so he said Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt, meaning her energy was so physical that she was not able to experience the higher spiritual planes that the others in her group went to, so she was left behind. This same situation is reenacted the world over, as each person chooses one path or another. A sojourn in Sodom and Gomorrah may be just what some people need, for perhaps cosmically they need to roll around in the physical, to taste it, to misuse it, to experience it falling apart on them. Once that is over, they are ready to accept a new experiment, a new attempt at balancing their energy. It is all a part of understanding the force and how it works, and there's no better way for the higher self to come down into the physical and find out. That is why what you are right now is so important.
It is an experiment in higher energy. And all the experiences you've ever had will be a part of your learning pattern that will not disappear at death, but will be transmuted gradually so that you understand yourself in a more loving and magnanimous context. That is why, in the universal sense, there is no sin. When the higher self split into various experiences, it knew there would be a possibility of infringement, restriction, strife, judgment, and so on. It accepted that, and it viewed it as a learning, as a practice session for its energy. There is no punishment other than what you feel about your actions. And when you act contrary to the universal law, you experience instant karma, your energy coming back at you. It may not seem instant because of the slow vibrational field we are in, but in the cosmic sense, it is immediate. In effect, your spirituality is measured by your capacity to be magnanimous, to open to all things, to truly express that limitless infinity within you. Chapter 5. Love of the Force Sets You Free As a small child, I was taught that God loved me. Then one day I fell out of a tree and I experienced pain. That pain persisted and for a while I could not understand why the force had let me down. Each of us has gone through the same thing. As a child, I asked a clergyman what, in his opinion, was the answer to my dilemma and I was disappointed that he had no good answer. He just mumbled something about God's plan. Try explaining God's plan to a small boy who has just fallen from a tree. I remember thinking it all unfair, and I found the clergyman's explanation unsatisfactory. We are taught that the force loves us, and then we have to reconcile that with the mayhem around us. We watch while various religious groups battle each other in the name of God, each claiming the force to his sole right, and we wonder what kind of God there must be out there who allows all this to happen. The answer lies in a deeper understanding of the force and the way that energy flows. The force loves you, but the concept was not properly understood by the philosophers who wrote the holy books, and that caused confusion. The love the force has for you is not an emotional love that, say, a kindly uncle may have for his niece or a mother for her child. It is a love that comes from the fact that the God force loves itself. Therefore, because it is in you, it loves you. And the way to enhance that love is to love yourself. By doing so, you consciously concentrate on the force and that makes it expand within you. This is not an egocentric, narcissistic love, but a love that comes from respecting all things. And the greatest living thing under your immediate control is your own self. This does not mean that you should not love others or go out of your way to help them. It means that you have to recognize yourself as God as the infinite life force, and express that as strongly as possible. Of course, charitable works have their place in the evolution of man, but they do not greatly magnify the force for those involved. If you send a bag of rice to a village in India, you have the emotional pleasure that doing so brings you, and the villagers have the physical pleasure of eating the rice, if it ever gets there. But neither of you has made much of an advance in perception of the force. The force, being beyond negativity, is not a part of the villagers' needs, nor is it aware of your emotional pleasure. Through acts of kindness, we practice magnanimity, and the recipients feel there is a power for good beyond their misery, but that is all. These actions rise and fall outside the force's immediate perception. Therefore, they do not really expand an individual's expression. Good works deal with external physical illusion rather than inner reality. That is why, if you concentrate on a god outside of yourself, you exert power in the wrong direction, and eventually it dissipates or weakens rather than magnifies what you are. By loving yourself and respecting all things, you complete an esoteric understanding of love, which grants you added power and helps you to grow. The part of your evolution that is farthest to the outside of the real you is your physical body. But because you're in the physical, it dominates. By loving and caring for it, you are saying, what I am is beautiful, what I am has value. I respect what I am, and I understand that each and every second of my life is an extension of the force. Love of self and the respect you show for your body is the first step in expanding your consciousness. Most people who wake to a higher sense of consciousness do so through nutrition and health. 
They look at their bodies and they begin to feel that perhaps they can control their life and their experiences on the earth plane. This is the first step in understanding the love of the force. This is why physical discipline is the first discipline of the initiates, not because anyone cares whether or not your body falls apart, but because concentrating on it and respecting it allows you to expand your inner self. You respect your body by learning about it and taking care of it. The average man cares more for his possessions. He pollutes his body, abuses it, and eventually disease sets in. Worse than that, a lifetime passes without his ever having experienced a true heightened power of self. He perceives the world through a sluggish body, weak emotions, poor thinking, and he says, this is the way it is. The initiate perceives the world from a position of power. He sees all the physical events, but he also sees some of the non-physical happenings. His five senses expand to accept more information. Because his body is disciplined, its power oscillates faster than does the power of other bodies, and the speed of oscillation is the initiate's secret. The unseen world of the initiates are right beside you. They permeate physical reality. As you grow to become a part of them, you'll be surprised to find that they are not what you expected. This is because our current belief patterns come out of the restrictions of the human mind. Once you cross over into the other worlds, you will find that the speed or quantity of the force those dimensions express grant them an electrifying spontaneity, which makes our ordinary world seem sluggish. It is incumbent on you to raise your energy for the heightened oscillation of the force cannot come down for you. That is the beauty of the force's impartiality, and that is why the evolution of mankind, with all its ups and downs, is such a great awakening. It allows man eventually to understand that the only person who can help him is himself. Aid should be given in a way that allows the recipients to help themselves rather than as a charity which, in effect, delays the day when they have the cosmic realization that they are the ones in charge. Once you accept true responsibility, loving yourself becomes easy, for you understand that it is you who control. If you lower your energy by, say, drinking too much, you cannot blame the force for any imbalance you pull to you, because that imbalance is a part of the energy pattern you have created. When two cars collide, the event has a metaphysical energy pattern. Both drivers brought themselves to that point in time through their own expression, feelings, and emotional balances or imbalance. The experience has a power. The collision, the injuries, the destruction have a vibrational oscillation, an actual metaphysical speed per millionth of a second. The same applies to your body and your life. Its totality has a vibrational level that rises and falls according to your mood, your physical condition, and the extent to which you guard your energy. Let us say, hypothetically, the man in the street has an average vibrational scale of 18,000 to 24,000 vibrations per millionth of a second. When his energy is strong, his vibrational scale hovers around 24,000. When it is low, it might drop to 18,000 cycles. Within that scale or wave band are millions and millions of probability patterns or events that have the same vibrational frequency. Positive inspirational events will have a higher frequency than negative restrictive ones. So a picnic in the country among friends and loved ones might have an average vibrational speed of, say, 24,000 cycles per microsecond. But if the picnic deteriorates into a violent family feud, then the overall energy of the people involved will suddenly drop down to, say, 18,000 cycles per microsecond. The metaphysical energy of your life constantly moves up and down within the wave band of energy you are able to maintain. Therefore, if a car accident has a metaphysical vibrational speed of, say, 18,000 cycles per microsecond, and your energy moves up and down between 18,000 and 24,000 cycles, it follows that a car accident is a possibility in your destiny pattern. It is one of the things that can happen, but as long as you keep your energy up, it never will. Once you let your energy drop, your chance of misfortune rises dramatically. Of course, it is not a matter of luck, but a matter of your energy being momentarily 
compatible with the energy of a car accident. Now, if you happen to be in a boat at sea and your energy drops, your chances of a car accident are nil, but you may experience another low energy event as a shark nibbling your foot. Energy has a spontaneity in the way it expresses itself, so it is difficult to say for certain that a person will definitely experience a particular event. But you can say that events in a certain range have a high probability pattern because the person in question maintains a similar energy level. Your life unfolds to the dictates of energy. Nothing less, nothing more. Once you come to grips with loving self and respecting the force within you, the wave band of energy that is you moves faster and faster. If it goes beyond, say, 30,000 cycles per microsecond, the possibility of your being involved in any kind of accident becomes remote. Your energy enters a dimension of greater positivity. You will arrive at the crossroads 10 minutes too late for there to be an accident, or something will cause you to take a different route. This is because your intrinsic spirituality or vibrational worth leads you away from negative events. You may ask, how can that be? It is a factor of energy as it seeks its own level. You cannot have two dissimilar energies oscillating side by side. If an energy of 18,000 cycles per microsecond tries to oscillate next to the energy of the initiate at, say, 100,000 cycles a microsecond, the slower energy tends to speed up a bit, but sooner or later it proves unable to keep up and falls away. As you walk through life, you will interact and deal with many people who are operating at 18,000 cycles a microsecond, and while they will be exhilarated by your vibrational level, they will not follow you for long. As you say, let us rise at dawn and swim in the lake, and then we will have a nice green salad for breakfast. They will become distracted, make excuses, and you will hear the sound of footsteps gradually getting fainter. That is the way things should be. Each follows the path that is comfortable for him, and we all have to experience fully the slower energy patterns before we can go beyond them. Eventually, all come to an understanding how energy really works, but thankfully, no one is asking you to stick around and wait for the others, and that is also the way it should be. When your energy rises higher and higher, and you find yourself in a vibrational scale of, say, 100,000 cycles per microsecond, Although still on the earth plane, you go beyond it, and your energy is so fast that the casual observer just does not see you. That is why you hear stories of the initiates being able to appear and disappear at will. The observer does not see an initiate until the initiate, through an act of consciousness, concentrates on the observer. So an initiate at the crossroads would not be seen by the drivers in the accident. But if he then crossed the road to bandage their bodies, they would see him. Whatever you concentrate on as an act of mind is the dimension you're in. If you love your body and concentrate on the force within, that very concentration pulls your energy gradually away from the earth plane. This is because you are going beyond the physical, emotional, and mental dimensions, beyond the ordinary man who fails to see the beauty in all things, who does not accept responsibility for his life, who tends to blame others for his circumstances. To expand your acceptance or love of the force, you have to extend that love and respect to others. Respecting them in the spiritual sense means allowing each to have a spiritual fulfillment without you infringing upon their life. In the same way as the guides and the higher powers respected you and allowed you to pull yourself up from where you used to be. If the initiate at the crossroads ran out and tried to prevent the accident, he would infringe upon the drivers and would probably injure himself. So he stands to one side, the benign observer. Once the accident is over and the drivers have experienced a further part of their growth process, the initiate steps forward and aids them as they cry for help. While he bandages their wounds, the drivers momentarily experience his higher energy pattern and little by little their perception grows. But if the initiate tried to force understanding on the drivers, he would only burn himself out and hinder his own. The energy of dedicated observation is so powerful that if you couple it with non-judgment, you instantly enhance your own strength. But many people, 
especially those of us brought up in the Western tradition, find it hard to do so because the whole Judeo-Christian ethic is centered on going out and converting others to the fold, feeding them, and enclosing them in structured belief patterns that act as a kind of spiritual scaffolding. This works well for souls who are in their early incarnations. It allows them time to understand themselves. That is why dogmatic religions do well in poor countries whose inhabitants are in their first few lifetimes on the earth plane, and structure is just what they need. But when people eventually become more spiritually sophisticated, they incorporate different belief patterns that center on their spiritual individuality, away from churches, dogma, structure, and form. They need to experience freedom, for they are ready to leave the earth plane forever. They have gone beyond restriction. They are free. Freedom was not the way of things 2,000 years ago when the Christian church was getting started. In its early years, it came under great threat, and for a while it looked as though it would completely die out. It badly needed supporters. The rulers and gentry of that time were either Romans or people financially influenced by Rome, and they tended to follow the Roman religion of Mithra and other cult religions. These leaders of society were not going to upset the status quo by siding with a radical new religion that would threaten their livelihood and possessions in Roman society. And so generally speaking, the church had to search for members among the outcasts, the poor, and the lower classes. That is why the subject in the story of the Good Samaritan is a Gentile, not a Jew or a Roman. What the church was saying was, it's okay if you're not one of the upper crust, the God force is with you. It does not recognize rank or status. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God. And that, of course, is true, for the force cannot be higher than itself. And as it is in everybody, it makes us all equal. In those days, there was no advertising and little writing. The only way to promote beliefs was by word of mouth. It was hard work. You had to get people to attend meetings and you had to get them there during daylight hours when most people would be tending their flock or doing whatever people did in biblical times. Promoters were faced with a double problem. They got around it cleverly by offering food as a way to get people to the meetings. People who were starving would have no time for philosophy, but once you fed them, they tended to be more receptive. This worked well and the attendance figures proved it. So you have stories of the feeding of the 5,000, the loaves and the fishes, and so on. Once these techniques were refined, the promoters incorporated the giving of food or charity into the master plan, much in the same way as a sales director today might give his salespeople a structured merchandising script and point-of-sale freebies. The whole point is that it worked and it was good for the church. And so you'll find the giving of food symbolically or literally has been incorporated into many Christian ceremonies. Therefore, deep within our psyche is rooted the concept that we have a duty to gather the poor and the outcasts and feed them, even though the original intention was not for us to take on the burdens of the world, but for the church to merchandise its meetings. This does not mean you ignore the pleas of others, but there has to be a spiritual purity in the way you relate to the world. Everything you have and everything you are is on short-term rental from the force. Therefore, if someone asks you for something, give it to them. Otherwise, you deny your ability to pull from the abundance around you. But to go out and to infringe upon people through haphazard charity is also a denial of the magnificence of the force, for it does not allow them to experience the fullness of the force for themselves. Some of these concepts are hard to master at first, as they take you away from the norm, away from mass thinking. But spiritual growth always involves swimming against the tide. This is not a philosophy for everyone. It is a path of power for those that want to step beyond the physical to a totally different alignment. A Taoist sage watches the world with dispassionate calm. When a person performs good works, he does not praise. When there is evil, he does not condemn, for he allows each person to experience without infringement. Non-judgment is loving the force within you by loving it in others and having the power to go beyond emotion by leaving each to his own. You may consider this callous. Do we not have a duty to help others, to bandage their wounds, to send them food and so on? If that is what you feel, then so be it. Within the universal mind, there is no right or wrong. 
Charity deals only with the physical, and if you embroil yourself too deeply in the affairs of others, you can tame yourself to a probability pattern lower than your full potential. What is important is that you do not allow a misconceived idea of your obligations to hold you back. Many people fail to develop metaphysically because they put something else, be it church, state, or family, in front of their own development. In so doing, they negate the force within themselves, because what they're saying is, I am worthless. This church, this state, this cause is more important than I. That is not your highest path. You have infinite potential as your birthright, and nothing should stand in your way. You are an individual. You have incarnated here to understand yourself, and a part of doing so is to learn to relate to others, your family and loved ones, but eventually it comes down to you on your own. You do not have a responsibility for the growth of others. Your responsibility is to the force within you, and you can never do more for the world than concentrate on that. Even though your contribution may not be obvious, on an inner level, it becomes a great power. When your expression of the force is faster than that of another, his energy is increased by your presence. That is what was meant by the grace of God, the inner oscillation. It is a power and has a scale of force, and even though we cannot measure it, it runs from high to low, and you can train yourself to be aware of that. Everyone you've ever dealt with, everyone you've ever walked past, has benefited from your energy. If that energy was high and in dedication to the purity of the force, you will never know what your power did for others. You just express it strongly and sustain it, and it protects you. The dedication surrounds you with a mystique, and that energy intermingles with others. This is your gift to mankind. People will send rice. You can be sure of that. But your gift is greater, silent, invisible. Rarely will anyone ever thank you, as we rarely thank the sun for shining upon us. Non-judgment, therefore, is your affirmation that the world is beautiful, that all is growth, and that you are going beyond it. Gradually, it disengages you from the earth plane, and as you begin to leave, you find a need to resolve all inner conflicts, not only with yourself, but with others. If you cannot resolve a situation with another individual, walk away. Leave them to be what they are, which is, after all, perfect, given the time and place in their infinite evolution. The universal law is the force in motion. It does not expect you to suffer a relationship that does not allow for your growth. In fact, in a dispassionate way, it wants you to have your freedom. For by unraveling the knots, you clear the way for more energy to flow from the higher self. Others are pulled by your intrinsic spiritual worth. The universal law is the force in motion. It does not expect you to suffer a relationship that does not allow you growth. In fact, in a dispassionate way, it wants you to have your freedom. For by unraveling the knots, you clear the way for more energy to flow from your higher self. Others are pulled by your intrinsic spiritual worth, not to what you say you are. By gradually developing non-judgment and non-conflict, you express the force to its highest, and this helps you grow. As you begin the process of enhancing the force within you, you have to consciously purify your energy at all times. This means taking care to release emotion, guarding against a buildup of negative energy, allowing your thought patterns gradually to strengthen as you concentrate on life. You may want to get out of your current circumstances and into others that will allow more balance. Do so. In the very change, you will find creativity flows, and the newness around you creates more opportunities. Many people sit around waiting for the world to discover them, and that rarely happens. If you move towards your goals, expressing all your power, opportunity will find you as a result of your actions. For by riding your energy... Knowing and believing your higher self is with you, you will be in the right place at the right time. But make the first move, taking constant care to purify and review your life. Move from negative habits into the fortress of light. Discipline is the horse you ride. The force is there, ready and waiting, neutral. If you are prepared to accept a higher power, you will step into an extraordinary state of consciousness and that you will find challenging, for it lies always beyond where you are now, moving ever faster and faster. Chapter 6. 
your life's ultimate goal. Let us review. You are not your physical body, your emotions, or your intellect. You are the infinite, limitless energy of your higher self experiencing for a short while here on Earth evolution within your body. The Force and you are one and the same, and the more you align with the positive, limitless, pure you, the more of the Force you express. By developing its energy within you, you can learn to communicate with an infinite source of knowledge. This allows an acceleration of spiritual growth, for you have access to information not only from the past, but from the present and the future. That knowledge is waiting for you to make use of it, and personal balance is the key to its access. Through balance, you open within yourself a door that allows perception of other worlds, and that perception is vital to your journey or quest. Before incarnating into your physical body, your higher self had an opportunity to survey the situation it was about to enter and accepted the circumstances of your life as a part of its heroic goal. It knew that if it could succeed in this existence, it would be able to go on to an even greater expression of the Force. Attached to your higher self is an energy whose responsibility it is to assist you in your evolution. We call that energy the Guide. It is a spirit entity that has completed all of its lives as a human on the earth and is now experiencing spiritual evolution as a helper, pushing energy through into the physical plane. Since its progress is inexorably linked to yours, the guide has an interest in making sure you do well. Often the guide is someone with whom you've had a past life, who is familiar with your energy and its needs. The function of the guide is to project energy or inspiration to allow you the maximum unfolding in this existence so that you can attain your life's heroic goal. That goal is known only to you, your guide, and your higher self. If you are young, it probably lies ahead of you. If you are old, you have probably gone through a good part of it, but there's always time to fine-tune what you are, to pull it all together into one crescendo of energy until finally you leave the earth forever to experience heightened forms of existence in other dimensions. How do you discover the nature of your life's goal? Usually it is a matter of resolving something within yourself rather than a mission to save the world. It consists of confronting and going beyond the very thing that you find the hardest to face or deal with. It could be trials and tribulations over money, or a problem with love of self, or through various incarnations, you might have failed to come into a natural understanding of sexuality, and are here this time to experience physicalness, motherhood perhaps, or dealing successfully with your body, away from misuse and possibly guilt. Sometimes your life's goal involves another person. Maybe you are here to resolve a conflict with someone that has gone on through many lifetimes. Now you and that person find yourself mother and son, brother and sister, or husband and wife. This time you are here to deal equably with that person and your other family members, remembering all the while that once you elevate yourself metaphysically, you are no longer allowed to infringe upon others. You should allow each to develop at his or her own speed and to make his or her own decisions. If you find yourself in a difficult relationship with someone, you can be sure that that very situation is a part of your life's goal. You have to learn to deal with it fairly and lovingly, resolving conflicts as best you can, allowing that person his or her highest growth without holding yourself back. Perhaps you find yourself in the burdensome situation of being custodian of someone who is mentally deficient or of a spirit evolving in an imperfect body that needs your care or perhaps of a family member in need of financial support. Helping that person will probably be a major part of your life's goal. There will be a spiritual reason why you find yourself in this position and by accepting it and working through it in love and service, the situation will change somehow and transcending your difficulties, you will step to freedom. You will stand in the complete glory of your inner self, a spirit, a power, ready to move on, ready to accept a new and brighter assignment. Some people's life's goal is to express a creative endeavor, which might be in the fine arts, in business, on the land, or in any other capacity where you challenge yourself creatively. 
You are here to learn to develop your inner creative energy to its highest without causing imbalance. Therefore, you begin to paint or write or compose or express yourself in some way. But as you do, you make sure that you have your life in reasonable order. It is pointless to be the grand master if you die of drink at the age of 33 and cause financial havoc all around you. You have to temper your creativity by balancing the other areas of your life, not infringing on others or forcing them to make up for your inability to handle the simple things such as paying the rent. If your creativity does not support you at this time, reduce your obligations to a bare minimum and mix your creativity with another endeavor that will allow you financial stability while you perfect your craft and gain acceptance. The life goal of many involves dealing with their body. They either create or inherit an imperfection which they learn to deal with. Weakness in your spiritual self often manifests itself in various forms of emotional energy, which will eventually show up in your body as physical problems. By looking at your body, you can learn about your inner self. It is a bit like translating a book from Hebrew into Greek and then into Latin and finally into English. It loses a little in the telling, but you get the gist of it. By working on your physical self, you begin to face the emotional problems that cause your body to become ill at ease, and gradually you patch up and strengthen your spiritual self also. Once you complete that, you are either healed or you leave the earth plane, but you do so as a complete entity, a spiritual power that can be used for the benefit of the universe at large, by assisting others to evolve. No one can really explain the miracle of self that awaits you. You have to experience it through your own efforts. Whatever you set out to do in dedication and love of self is instantly rewarded on an inner plane, and you experience that reward in this life and in the afterlife. To establish strong spiritual growth, you have to be in control of your mind. Otherwise, its reasonableness will trick you into accepting less than best. It does so to avoid facing your life's heroic goal, which it finds uncomfortable. By its nature, it will constantly pull you down an undisciplined path, because it knows that when you wallow in weakness, it is in control. Your goal, therefore, is to concentrate on your strengths, believing in yourself, loving yourself, not infringing on others, and going beyond those things that you find the hardest to deal with. Accepting that goal is half the battle. Taking responsibility for yourself is the other half. When you stand with your life firmly in your hands and say, Force, guides, higher self, I take full command of my life and I'm working on the bits I don't like, you come into a cosmic maturity. Events around you become a symbol of what you are and the force supports you because you're not leaning on others metaphysically. Through this simple dedication, you enter an elite group once you've cleared out the debris that has accumulated over the years, you'll be able to develop the power of the force in the new world, the one that is being gradually created by the few who know where the destiny of man really lies. What, therefore, is your gift to humanity? It is to express what you are in beauty and strength, knowing that you are an eternal power. A sparrow has beauty because it expresses the force naturally. It is its very essence or burden-likeness that gives it charm. And yet what does it amount to? A sparrow is no more than a little lump of bone and feather, two toothpicks for legs and a silly tweet for a voice, but it gives pleasure without even knowing it. The reason for this is that its power is not cluttered by mind or emotion. It is pure, a spontaneous example of the life force in motion. Imagine what potential to express the force you would have if you could reach the uncluttered purity of a small bird. What would be your power to give pleasure and inspiration? It would be immense, would it not? Through your efforts, others would rebuild themselves, for they would see that within the turmoil and chaos, there was a bird singing, there was a power, there was a pathway out of the morass. They would be able to see you just a way down the path ahead of them, and they would say, if he or she can make it, so can I. That is your gift, the pure self you express, your smile, the way you walk, the things you do, the way you drive your car, the way you handle your children, your daily dedication to those around you. That is your gift, 
As you develop yourself spiritually, people will come to you, for the force knows how to make use of its supporters, and it will allow you, through the intrinsic value of your spiritual energy, to go further, to shine ever more brightly, and you will understand more and more deeply that what you are is God. There is nothing that you cannot do. There are no real limits to your capacity. Your heritage is to express a power for the benefit of yourself and then of others, and by silently expressing that power, you allow a renaissance to come about. Within mankind, there is a long-forgotten dream. It is the dream of a time when purity of spirit ruled the earth, when love truly supported mankind, when each had time to evolve as he or she wished, a time when the individuality of self was revered, a time when there were no governments, no religions, no rules or regulations, for each person understood his responsibility to others, and there was no infringement or mass thinking or forced conformity. There was spontaneous enlightenment, instinctive creativity, and you heard the laughter of man having fun. Through your knowledge and power, that time will return, not for all mankind, but for you and for those that will be attracted to individuals such as you, who are expressing powerfully. For in the darkest times, the force always provides a spark of light, the light that is carried by a few and later passes to others. Your heritage, your heroic life's goal, is to work upon yourself to the point where the force grants you the right to carry its light. And when you have done so for a while, you will earn the right to do other things. You will look back at the world and you will hear a funny bag of bones with toothpick legs go tweet. And somewhere a man will laugh in an atmosphere of total calm. And you will be able to say to yourself, I helped create that. And you will know what was meant by the golden age.